So hello everyone. Thanks a lot for joining this uh, this uh, unique session on seaweed at the COP. So that's the only uh, session that is purely dedicated to uh, to seaweed during all this COP, which is kind of uh, a shame because seaweed may uh, well be our greatest untapped resource to mitigate uh, climate change. I will try to answer this. To to uh, to start with a nice uh, a, a nice note, I have I brought for my friends here in the assembly that I will uh, uh, introduce them some some good uh, seaweed delicacy to share uh, all the way from Korea. Um, so I will let you share this. <laughs> I have also one from uh, from Scotland, local one because seaweed is a, a local resource for many. We have to remember that fifty percent of the population live in less than one hundred kilometers from the sea. It's a very local food. Um, so that's a, that's a, that's the food that is served at COP. Actually, we have some at the canteen there. So it's a congratulations to Mara Seaweed who made it uh, and who really create a, a good uh, stuff. So that's powder here we have. So you can uh, you can all test and we will uh, <laughs> we will all share this. And uh, so that's the report that we have produced for seaweed as a natural based solution. You can download the report at uh, seaweedclimatesolution.com. Um, that's a report that we have uh, uh, put together, but we will go through that report over the next session. And, and the last thing, because talking about decarbonizing the economy, we have to we have to remove some unsustainable products. So that that glass here is made of seaweed, so it's uh, you, you, it's all it's compostable, recyclable, and even edible actually as a glass. So you can um, so yeah, that, that, I think that's part of the future, and we'll discuss that uh, with our, some of our people here. So there are so many applications for seaweed. To feed the world, to clean the ocean, uh, to uh, feed animals and cut methane emission by large, uh, to, uh, to to uh, restore biodiversity, to provide new sources of medicines, to uh, yeah provide habitat to to marine life and uh, and and provide new revenues to coastal community. And we also know that it is contributing to women empowerment in emerging countries, which is such an important topic as well. But for the opening remark on this uh, on this work, I will ask uh, my my colleagues. Uh, Peter Thompson uh, to give some opening uh, intro. He does that very, very well. Uh, he's getting trained over the last uh, days, I think, <laughs> to do that well. So I will have Peter Thompson, special envoy uh, for the UN SDG 14, Life Below Water, to give us some opening remark on, uh, on, on this uh, miracle that lies beneath the sea. Thanks very much. Uh, no pressure. I, I do this well. <laughs> Look, um... I was speaking on my three favorite subjects today because I started on uh, the green zone speaking about mangroves and then I came to a coral event over here and now I'm speaking about seaweed and uh, you know there's nothing nicer to speak about in terms of the future. Uh, let's just remind ourselves why we're here and that's why I wear this. It's put together by my grandchildren, I've got th four granddaughters and uh, it's kids rights now. You know, we're winning our small victories here, some pretty big, big victories. We have our defeats at these cops, uh, etc. But what are we doing this for? We're doing it for our kids. It's not our enjoyment, right? It's not because we want our NGOs to do a bit better or whatever. It's them. They are condemned to a three degree world. The WMO has told us that. They, these kids are going to be alive when we get to three degrees on our current path. That's a world on fire. That's a world of landslides and unending storms. And we refuse that for our kids and for our grandchildren. I'm sure you're with me on that. So let's just first of all, remind ourselves, where does this miracle solution seaweed, because I do believe in it so strongly, fit into that? It fits into that, saving our kids. Second reason uh, I'm here is obviously to join the, the fight to bring down greenhouse gas emissions. And I think we're doing pretty well at this COP so far. But it's also as part of that to move the climate finance needle in the direction of the sustainable blue economy. Why? What's the logic in that? It's because the sustainable blue economy is our future, whether it's renewable energy or it's medicines in the post-antibiotic age, or whether it's uh, our nutrition. And when we get to nutrition, again, this is the important bit, seaweed for me. I hate that word seaweed, by the way. I think it's an English problem. I'm sure in some of your languages, it's a much nicer word. I, I, I heard in French, it's uh, algae. Yeah. I, yeah, which I don't like algae much either. It doesn't sound very ed edible. But you know, seaweed, seaweed is a sea, well, sea veggie or something. Let's come up with something better than seaweed. It sounds like we're eating something from the gutter. But uh, we're not, of course. 
It's uh, so nutritious. It's so delicious. Uh, let me tell you a little story. I went uh, to boarding school in New Zealand from Fiji. We had a thing called Chinese gooseberries. They used to boil it and give it to us on Sundays as a treat with a sugary syrup. Then some guy said, uh, we could do something with these. This guy in New Zealand. And he did a bit of research. He managed to make them less hairy. Uh, and uh, he said, if we're going to sell this to the world, we need to give it a name. And they, somebody smart came up with the name kiwi fruit. All right now, if you go to Japan, where's my Japanese friend I was talking to earlier? And, and you talk about kiwi fruitsu, and you say, uh, oh, this was invented in New Zealand back in the 70s. You say, no, no, kiwi furutsu, this is a part of Japanese culture and everything. It's not. Kiwi, of course, is the name for a New Zealander, kiwi bird and so on. It was developed there. And then that went to the world. My point being, food is fashion. I went in 1981 to open the Fiji embassy in Tokyo. I lived there for three or four years. Nobody in the world was eating sushi in those days except the Japanese, maybe some in Korea as well. But uh, the world knew nothing about it. Then they started to catch on. And there was this thing of raw fish. You want to eat raw fish? What? Yeah, but it's nice rice and it's wrapped in seaweed. You want to eat seaweed? Look at it now. You cannot go to a town anywhere in the world without a sushi being there. And that all happened in a, a very short space of time. There's two examples from my lifetime of food is fashion, where something was unknown and then it was everywhere in the world. And I'm looking at Sainavoti over there because he knows I'm gonna mention Nama. Nama is my favorite food in Fiji. It's a sea grape, a seaweed, a sea grape. They would call it Nama. And it grows in, uh, in the reef. You need a good uh, passage of water to, uh, to cultivate it, but I think we could give that to the world. It is the most crunchy, delicious thing you're ever gonna eat, particularly with seafood. It's just wonderful with seafood, but you can eat it with other forms of food. So why not take that sustainable aquaculture? When I talk about future of uh, humanity is sustainable economy, and part of that is on nutrition, huge element of that is new ethical forms of aquaculture. Uh, and not just on our, on our coastal areas, out there in the middle of the ocean. We find places with, with rich in nutrients out there in the ocean with upwellings and so on. We have our farms out there growing nama, you know, growing the, the other forms of seaweed that are so nutritious. And if you haven't tried that snack yet, my God, just have a taste of that. See how good that tastes. That's, you're, you're eating the sea when you eat that uh, snack. Congratulations to whoever made that. Uh, so, you know, folks, don't let anybody tell you that, uh, you know, seaweed doesn't have a future. It is part of that sustainable uh, future that I'm sure you can all see ahead of us, because why? Because you, like me, refuse the three degree future for our children. And uh, I know that Carlos will be telling you about how seaweed helps that in terms of sequestering carbon. I'm sure he'll be addressing that. But uh, generally, we are here, this small group of people beamed out to the world to address a very important part of that jigsaw that we're going to need to deny that future of three degrees for our kids. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you very much, Peter, for this uh, inspiring world as usual. Uh, I fully am fully with you. We should change the name. Actually, the name does it a disservice because, there's, as I mentioned, there's many, many applications about uh, seaweed, but there's one I've never met so far. And some maybe you will uh, disagree with me, but I've never met anyone smoking seaweed. So I think we should say seaweed is not weed, definitely. So <laughs> let's call them sea vegetables so people can understand how delicious they are. Let's call them sea forest so people can understand we, can, we should protect them. But indeed, seaweed is not the right word. Seaweed is the only food that reverses climate change. And I would ask, uh, will ask the best specialist in the world, maybe about this uh, seaweed and carbon sequestration to comment on this. Uh, Carlos Duarte with us from uh, Ocean 2050 and the University of Saudi Arabia. He has published many articles in Nature about, uh, about the potential for uh, seaweed as a carbon uh, sequestration uh, tool. And he's running some very interesting uh, quantification of this uh, carbon sequestration potential at the moment. Is really uh, leading the pack in terms of uh, seaweed and carbon sequestration with Ocean 2050 and Alexandra Cousteau. 
So Carlos, tell us what you're doing and what you how you foresee the future of uh, seaweed as a way to mitigate climate change. Thank you, Vincent. Uh, so uh, as Vincent indicates, uh, about four years ago, we asked the question whether uh, seaweed farming could actually be a solution for uh, climate action and therefore contribute to uh, carbon sequestration. And the reason why we asked this question is that uh, we developed the concept of uh, blue carbon in which I was uh, heavily involved uh, to uh, restore and conserve uh, coastal habitats like mangrove seagrasses and salt marshes to uh, contribute to carbon removal and therefore climate action. There has been a very successful strategy and you hear a lot about blue carbon in uh, COP26 and it's really a, an emerging strategy, but it is limited in the scope because uh, these habitats together occupy about uh, uh, 300,000 square kilometers, uh, a very narrow fringe of shoreline. And yet uh, the potential is such that we can extend that beyond that. In fact, uh, seaweed or macroalgae occupy about seven, square kilo, seven million square kilometers of ocean space. Uh, and in fact, if you put all the seaweed together, all the macroalgae, it is the same area and the same productivity as the Amazon. But we don't recognize those forests of the sea for their contribution. We really think of seaweed of, as discussed as something nasty and so on, but really the potential is huge. It's an Amazonian forest that is in the sea, but it's very difficult to activate the wild seaweed for carbon sequestration because the carbon is exported out to the deep sea and ends up in sediments, but it's very difficult to trace back the origin of that carbon to particular actions. So there's many reasons why we should conserve the kelp forests, uh, but probably uh, climate action is going to be a difficult one because of the uh, difficult to very, difficulties to verify where this carbon ends up. So seaweed farming in uh, contrast is, uh, is located typically in very shallow environments uh, above uh, um, uh, muddy to sandy sediments, and therefore the carbon that is removed from the seaweed during growth uh, ends up uh, deposited in the seafloor and might be sequestered in the soils, very much like happened for uh, seagrass, but it has never been accounted for. So we did uh, some back of the envelope calculations, assuming that uh, seaweed farms work like a wide seaweed forest, where about 11% of the carbon ends up sequestered. And that will take us to something like three tons of carbon dioxide sequestered per hectare in a seaweed farm, more or less in the average seaweed farm. But no one has a really a measured carbon sequestration below seaweed farms. So as Vincent indicated uh, with uh, Alexandra Cousteau, uh, with whom I collaborate in an organization called Oceans 2050, which goes to rebuild the abundance of marine life by 2050, then we thought that uh, seaweed farming could be a regenerative approach to both achieve uh, climate goals, but also produce wonderful products that uh, will be an underpinning for a sustainable future. So we took it upon ourselves to uh, quantify carbon sequestration with seaweed farming. And we established uh, last year a global uh, network of seaweed farms that includes 23 seaweed farms around the world in many nations, and some of them are, are really small and new seaweed farms because uh, in the Western world, uh, the largest is maybe a few hectares and only about five or 10 year old uh, compared to the East, but we include them all. So we have uh, uh, many nations involved in the network and the oldest uh, seaweed farm is, in the network is located in Japan and it's been in operation for 300 years. In the Western world, we, there's the sense that we just discovered seaweed farming, right? But in the East, it's, it's a long standing tradition. And this uh, farm has been in operation for 300 years. So it also tells you about how sustainable uh, seaweed farming can be. The largest farm is located in China and it's 600 square kilometers in size. And you can see it from, from a space. But altogether, seaweed farming occupies about 2000 square kilometers globally. That is uh, 250,000 times less than the area that we use to grow vegetables on land. Uh, but the potential is huge. So we established this network and uh, we've been uh, obviously impacted by COVID in terms of uh, being able to sample and even analyze the samples. But three weeks ago, we met for the first time in Monaco because one of the partners is the UN International Atomic Energy Agency. And the reason why they participate is that they have a mandate to uh, 
promote the use of radioisotopes for peaceful purposes. So we use a lead to 10 to calculate a chronologies in the sediments, to calculate the age of sediments. Then we calculate the stocks of carbon in sediment velocity with farms. And then we combine the two together to calculate carbon burial from seaweed farms in the sediments below the seaweed farm. So when we did our back of the envelope calculation, we came up to something around three uh, tons of carbon dioxide uh, per hectare sequestered. And as I mentioned, there's not yet a single value that has been measured published in the literature. But three weeks ago, we were able to put the first, uh, so this is a big announcement. Everybody uh, in COPE now silence because we're going to make a big announcement that we've calculated for the first time a carbon sequestration rates below seaweed farms, actually for five of the 23 for which we have complete data sets. The other ones will be finalized before the end of the year. And the estimate we came up with the mean is 3.5 tons of carbon dioxide per hectare per year. So very close to our calculations, but of course, calculations need to be verified. But uh, none of these uh, farms were actually designed to bury car carbon. So they were not optimized for this function. And the highest uh, of the five farms so far uh, has sequestered about 10 uh, tons of carbon per hectare per year. And we see uh, data yet incomplete from other farms, particularly in Canada, where sequestration rates can be much higher. So putting that in uh, relative terms, uh, the average seaweed farm is uh, contributing to carbon sequestration per hectare as much as three hectares of Amazonian forest, right? So these are uh, forests that we grow on the sea that provide food for humans, but while the crop is growing in the sea before it is harvested, it is function, functioning as a forest, as a rainforest that sequesters carbon. So we need to find ways in which this uh, new service that seaweed farms is uh, it's uh, used as a climate uh, action. The farmers need to be compensated for this uh, service. There's been no farmer that has been compensated yet for climate services. And then we need to develop a program to expand seaweed farming from the very small area of 2,000 square kilometers to what we believe is the sustainable uh, global area uh, without creating any uh, unintended consequences on other habitats which can be about uh, 4 million square kilometers. So that means a 2000 fold increase from the current area. And we already know where this can be deployed. And the total uh, scope, if we develop that full potential is 115 petagrams of carbon removed per year. So that's three times current uh, emissions, right? So the potential is huge. And then you harvest the crop and you use it to displace synthetic plastics, you use it to alleviate famine, you use it to uh, also produce sustainable feed for farm animals. We use it to remove methane emissions because red algae can uh, contribute to remove, uh, uh, shut down uh, methane emissions from ruminants. So there are many, many benefits after you harvest the seaweed, but while growing in the water, then you have that big benefit of uh, carbon removal, which I think is something we need to activate. And I would love to see the the seaweed uh, change names and play a big role in the forthcoming UN conference in Lisbon, also postponed from 2020 in June next year. So uh, one, one last thing about the name, and is that uh, one of the areas where seaweed is naturally increasing because of climate change is the Arctic. So uh, kelp forests are increasing along Greenland and the Canadian Arctic as ice cover decreases. And then I was discussing with uh, uh, Greenlandic politicians about the scope to uh, farm seaweed in Greenland because there's no vegetables produced. So that will be a big source of uh, healthy foods from Greenlanders. And after a whole workshop of discussion, then they said that they have a problem with the name again. And uh, you, I don't know if you know much about Greenlandic uh, language, but a word is about a sentence. So a word is actually a sentence that describes something. And then when they translated to English, what uh, the word seaweed actually means, which is kelp, is the thing you use to clean yourself after going to the toilet. So <laughs> obviously, obviously kelp do, don't have very good reputations in Greenland. And they also associated with famines because when they are sort of hunting and fishing, then they use seaweed. So we probably need a UN special ambassador for ocean to come with a clever name for <laughs> seaweed uh, macroalgae that also works in Greenland. Thank you.
Yeah, I think I think thank you very much, uh, Carlos. Very very good, and I think very clear. As usual, uh, I think we all understand that 250 times uh, less seaweed uh, cultivation that, than than vegetable cultivation on on. Uh, 250,000 times. So there's, there's a lot to grow. I keep saying we, we moved from prehistory to modern and history and to civilization 12,000 years ago when we stopped being hunters gatherers and we are still hunters gatherers in the ocean. Uh, we are in the stone age and I think I really believe we are uh, at the eve of a neolithic revolution when it comes to seaweed where it can really uh, totally change the paradigm. When we hear about seaweed, as you mentioned, uh, we often talk about invasive species and the sargassum and all these things. So I would like uh, to ask uh, Alison Myers to introduce herself and to tell us what uh, what uh, you are doing. Alison is with us uh, from uh, from very far, obviously, because that doesn't look like Glasgow behind you. Uh, <laughs> so tell us more about what you are doing, and uh, you have an amazing uh, project to, to to support Alison. So go ahead. Yes, thank you very much, Vincent, and thank you to all the speakers. It's really a pleasure to be with you um, here. Uh, I'm sitting in Washington, D.C., unfortunately, can't be with you, um, but mainly because we're about to get on a uh, very large ship in a few days and go out to the tropical Atlantic to do this work. So anyway, it's a pleasure to be with you, even by Zoom. Um, it's also a pleasure to work on this important topic. Um, so what is it about seaweed? Um, I have a few slides. If you'd like to see them, let's give it a try. Yes, all good. We can Great. see clear. Perfect. So um, what is it about seaweed? So we're all here talking about it. The reasons are simple. Besides great food and other beneficial uses, the ocean absorbs CO2 and seaweed absorbs CO2 from the ocean. It's really an ideal partnership. In fact, the ocean absorbs more than a quarter of our CO2, assisting our atmosphere but there are consequences as the ocean acidifies. This is a problem for shelled organisms and the food web since everything's connected. We need our oceans vibrant, biodiverse and productive as it provides half of our oxygen. Seaweed is a gift as it absorbs CO2 like land-based plants. With oceans covering 70% of the planet, we have much more area to grow it as Carlos has just indicated. The US Department of Energy recognized this and funded a program called Mariner to research and implement new ideas. This innovative department known as the Advanced Research Agency, a very tough name for a great group of people, speaking of tough names, but they had the amazing foresight in our CO2 rich world to request ideas to produce carbon rich seaweed. Technical term is macroalgae, maybe no better in terms of names, but to do it at energy scale. So think of corn for ethanol, but without fertilizers, fresh water for irrigation or land use, all uh, basically the model for agriculture. So we have an existing roughly $8 billion industry primarily for food, but it was a cottage scale industry. And as Carlos mentioned, we're, this is really all about scale if we, if we want to make an impact. So the immediate questions from the DOE ask were, how much area would this take? What are the economics? And in fact, there are four cost drivers for macroalgae production. Hatchery to produce a starter algae, farm equipment to contain the algae and lift it to the sun, harvest and transport. One alga of the thousands floats, thereby eliminating the need for farm equipment to lift it to the sun for photosynthesis. And it vegetatively reproduces. So that essentially means um, the fragments break and it becomes a new plant. So we wouldn't need a lab and a hatchery. That's two of the four cost drivers. So at this point, we felt that we were getting close. We had to be able to produce it at less cost than other systems, and we got to work. As anyone knows, with an idea, the real work is the 95% perspiration. DOE provided us with cost targets and energy budget and constraints. No new fertilizers. Today, we're in a phase two with our project working in open ocean. 
we're designing experiments and equipment, testing the idea, internalizing protection of other species, especially endangered. This is super important. Um, macroalgae farms provide a kind of habitat and we have to be very careful about how we harvest, but we can do this. It's just a practical consideration to be solved. So the context of Sargassum is especially interesting. The Sargasso Sea in the Atlantic Ocean provides 7% of the ocean biological, of the carbon biological pump of the planet. The floating seaweed eventually sinks to the sea floor, carrying its carbon with it. This is why we should look to the sea. Processes are at work that we should understand as relevant to our current CO2 challenge. Seaweed is helpful for CO2 upkeep uptake, but also to ocean productivity. About 10 or 11 years ago, another sargassum production system began to establish in the tropical Atlantic. This southern sister to the Sargasso Sea, the Sargassum Belt, is different than its northern counterpart, which is a rich habitat for migrating species. The southern version brings its carbon-rich biomass straight to shore, as if knocking on our door, telling us, pay attention. The ocean just gave us a raw material for the economy, a biological tool. This floating biomass not only returns our plastic to the shore, thank you, we needed to clean that up, but causes big damage both economically and environmentally until we notice. Tourists eventually, tourists evidently do not like a meter deep of decomposing seaweed on their beach, so they leave. Now hotels are paying attention. And environmentally, the beaching seaweed covers seagrasses, which provide oxygen, covers corals, and basically depletes oxygen levels during decomposition. Instead of noticing this biological gift of CO2 in a harvestable form, we spend a lot of money cleaning it up, approximately 120 million direct costs in 2018 in the Caribbean. So bulldozers are out there removing sand and seaweed, so much for our erosion problem, taking it to landfills, which are filling up on islands. This is short-term thinking, the current management regime. Let's turn it into renewable fuel or building products or sink it to the bottom of the sea if we can find a non-intrusive way to do this, like the carbon biological pump. So we tested the idea of sinking biomass to the deep sea this past year. And this is a very um, small experiment, um, but we weren't really budgeted to do this. So we did what we could. Before we conduct this on a large scale, we must understand the potential impacts on the systems and organisms, where and how this can be accomplished. The systems interconnect, so we need to understand these connections before engaging them. As we know, time is pressing for solutions. So the faster we learn, the better. I've spoken with scientists. Some say the ocean is vast. We would not impact it by sinking biomass. Nature already does it. Others talk about oxygen minimum and deplete zones. The point is, let's understand quickly so that if we need to use this method, over and above the economic uses of the biomass for fuel or products, like we've discussed here today, we'll have the information. If we combine our talents to work together, collecting data and using common sense, we will create solutions. Cross-disciplinary teams, whether your field is satellite imagery, marine engineering, aquaculture, or you're a person on the street with a good idea. We all have a role. Some will grow seaweed for food, some for fuel or CO2 removal. These are all good and productive ideas. The kids in the street today are having their say. Hopefully they will be innovators tomorrow, back in their science and math classes. That's what it's going to take, all of us working together. Our goal is big, to reduce emissions and historic CO2 in the atmosphere but how exciting to work on such an important problem. Everyone in this meeting has unique talents to contribute to a solution. Look at how the system functions, find its excesses, in this case, CO2, and like all things in nature, find something that needs that excess. 
let's be a positive part of our systems. I call this restorative commerce. Call it the circular economy or an economic revolution. I look forward to seeing you all at the table making the world better. Thank you for joining today and um, good luck to all of us. Okay. Thank you very much, Alison, for this inspiring word and in, uh, this presentation. We all agree with you. We need to be all together to do that. I mean, uh, that, that's really important. So we have, uh, we have the work from everyone. I, I, I would like to give the floor now to the other side. I mean, we, we, we mentioned that, uh, yes, uh, seaweed is the only food that reverses uh, climate change indeed. Um, so let's let's when we talk about food, uh, we need to uh, hear the word from the large brands who are really driving the market and provide the uh, the, uh, the, the, the drive on the, on the on the market and this and we need we need to eat food in a way or another. If we want to make of this uh, a sustainable market as resilient as in China, we need to eat uh, seaweed altogether. And as you say very well, we all have the power to change. Four times a day, we are environmental activists. We dec decide what we want to eat and we shape the world we want. So I will ask uh, Owen Bettel from Nestle, a sustainability director for Nestle to, uh, to comment on, uh, on, uh, on this. What is the potential from the Nestle perspective, which is the biggest uh, food brand in the world by far? So how do you see the potential of seaweed and the various applications and, and where are we at Nestle? I know that there's already, it's, it's already on the radar, I would say. And, uh, and that you are progressing on this. And I think it's highly important. And you are part of the coalition of the Safe Seaweed Coalition that we have established in order to bring people together. And this is part of the governance for this coalition. So when, let us know what, what, what the seaweed is, where the seaweed is with Nestle. Sure, so thank you very much. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. And I, although I'm on the panel, I'm also in the audience today because I'm, I'm learning a lot. And I'm feeling more inspired from all of the, the seaweed advocates that are clearly out there. and. Uh, you know, it's it, it's a good thing to to come to these conferences and learn as much as it, as it is to tell about uh, tell you what we're doing as a company. So, I think there's multiple different applications for seaweed, and you know, you mentioned food, but it goes much beyond that. Of course, um, we are really interested in helping create a regenerative food system. Um, so, and, and that needs to be done at scale to reduce carbon emissions and to uh, address some of the issues with the food system that have led to a loss of nature, um, negative impacts on water resources and communities. So we need to move to, to having a positive impact and we want to be part of that solution as Nestle. Um, and uh, I would say that seaweed and the ocean has been a little bit conspicuous by its absence so far in our planning and our strategy. I don't think we're alone in that regard, um, but uh, nonetheless, there's a big opportunity to, to look at and to, to address. Uh, and you've mentioned some of the applications already. So another one to add to the list would be, would be supplements and health related products. And so um, that's actually the fastest growing part of our company and not something maybe people would normally associate with Nestle, but we have a, a health sciences division and, um, you know, seaweed and related ingredients can play a, a clearly play a, a key role there. Um, we have a, a huge need on the side of packaging to find more sustainable solutions, ones that do not lead to negative environmental impacts. And uh, we've seen uh, Vincent with his cup there, you know, a very uh, tangible example of what that might look like. And um, we're working on uh, things like uh, PET, PET bottles of the future, but could we look at seaweed as, a, as an alternative material as well? I think that's very interesting and exciting. Um, seaweed also has a potential to role to play from a carbon perspective. So it was interesting to hear about your, uh, your research in that area. Um, we're looking really at insetting in order to reach net zero. So we have a big land-based footprint. Uh, we source coffee, dairy, cocoa, palm oil, these types of commodities where there are ways of reducing the environmental impact and turning to a positive impact and, and to uh, make sure that projects within those supply chains uh, reduce and remove carbon from the system. But if we start to use seaweed as a food ingredient, could that also lead to more insetting opportunities and less pressure on land? Uh, I think that's interesting to explore. Um, then there's there's basically applications within food where we might be using seaweed already, but we're not really talking about it. We're not really advocating for that. And I think there's, there's there again, is an opportunity. Um, we had a conversation yesterday where you mentioned that it was probably more prevalent in our portfolio than even we know, you know, because it's uh, it's there as a, as, as a minor ingredient or a supportive ingredient. Um, so that's, again, something to explore. And, and then I guess 
on the agriculture side, you mentioned methane. Um, we're one of the largest dairy companies in the world. So um, modifying the feed of cows is a big potential solution. We're putting a lot of um, investment into that, a lot of uh, a lot of hope really around um, modified ruminant feed as a way of reducing methane emissions in the short term, hitting our climate objectives and utilizing seaweed in, in the same way. So, you know, I think the applications are, are significant. Uh, there's a lot of potential there. I'm not sure seaweed flavored Nespresso is quite going <laughs> to take off just yet. We might need to work on that one. But uh, nonetheless, um, I'm, I'm hopeful about that. And I look forward to learning more really. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you very much for this, and uh, we are hopeful as well. And uh, we need, once again, we need your help, we need your support, we need your drive on this. It's, it's so important. You mentioned that seaweed provides indeed a lot of ecosystem services. We also know, and it was mentioned by Carlos, that they are disappearing at the moment. So, so we are all concerned about the fire in the Amazonian forest. No one really cares about this fire that is under uh, the ocean, beneath the sea. And, uh, but we have a, a massive source of carbon sequestration that is disappearing. Today, the wild seaweed are absorbing as much carbon as the combined emission of UK and France in the world. That's quite massive, once again. Um, so I would like to, to, to turn to, uh, to Stephen from the Plymouth Lab, Lab Laboratory to tell, tell us about what the state of the wild seaweed and the biodiversity it supports and what type of ecosystem services it provides, because we have not much, talked much about the, the, the phosphorus and nitrogen. Uh, uh, absorption as well no uh, thank you very much um well the majority of my work with seaweeds has primarily been looking at wild stocks and the and the goods and services and uh, that they provide for primarily biodiversity and other parts of ecosystem function um so it kind of leads me to having two requests really i'm i'm quite excited by the concept of of seaweed farming and, and cultivation and increasing the the amount of seaweed we, we produce for various reasons. But my first request, I think, is, is that we do it in a way that learns from the unsustainable terrestrial pr um, practices that we've adopted in the past. So some of the work we've done in the past where we've looked at the holdfasts that, that, that anchor the, the kelp to the, to the seafloor. And the biodiversity of organisms that live within those holdfasts, they can, they can hold hundreds of different species of, of worms, of, of shrimps, of mollusks, of, of crabs, all living together within this, this holdfast. It's an incredible, it's like, like a whole ecosystem all in one, one place. And we, we decided, we had a bit of a crazy idea. We thought we'd take these kelp holdfasts to the local hospital and get them scanned on the CT scanner to have a look at the complexity inside. And what we found was that the more complicated the structure was inside, the higher biodiversity it could hold. Um, so when we think about farming practices for some of these things, are there practices that we could adopt that would maintain that ecosystem service as well as then providing carbon for export and uh, carbon for consumption as well. So are there harvesting practices with, that would leave this amazing ecosystem of biodiversity there whilst we took the carbon we needed in another way? Also, the diversity of natural sea, seaweed communities shouldn't be underestimated as well. You know, are there ways in which we can farm seaweeds that embraces that? Um, biodiversity. So we're not just farming a single species, but we're, we're, we're using the diversity of different species of, of algae, which might produce different products, but in a, in a much more balanced and, and realistic kind of way as how these communities would normally exist. Because the more complexity you can maintain in the seaweed communities, the more biodiversity you can support uh, that's associated with that. So let's, let's see how that we can, we can farm seaweed in a way that isn't just focused, isn't just focused on a, a single benefit, such as either carbon export or food production, but actually is, is delivering across. And it, it might be that we need, to, we need to not be as effective in one of those if it means that the, the, the gross product of all of them added together is more yeah so not always the pursuit of a single product at the expense of the others 
The other request I have, and it's, it goes back to the point you made, Collis, about why, why hasn't seaweed been recognized as the blue carbon habitat? And you're completely right. It's largely because the carbon that that seaweed produces is, is transported somewhere else for a large, I mean, with natural stocks. For seaweed farms, it might be a little bit different and, and the connection between the production and the, and the sequestration sites may be a lot tighter. But certainly with natural stocks that we've looked at, where the transport of seaweed derived carbon can go tens of kilometers offshore before it's sequestered within, within the sediment. And looking at the sargassum, it can travel hundreds and thousands of kilometers from where it first starts to grow. So what we need to do is, it, is, is to manage our marine ecosystems in a much more holistic way. Some of this um, sort of drab, uninspiring fields of Sea, muddy seafloor that everyone looks at and go, well, that's pretty dull and boring. It's not a coral reef. It's actually really important. And we, we undertake some, some really destructive practices, you know, seabed trawling, which resuspends sediment, resuspends the carbon that's been um, deposited there, creates remineralization, releases the CO2 back in there. We need to recognize that the importance of not only the, the sources of this carbon, but also the sinks. And actually, those areas can be quite dependent on the, the carbon that's produced by seaweeds. We've, we have seen that seaweed grown along the coast can be transported these tens of kilometers off, and they actually provide a significant amount of the carbon required to sustain the biodiversity that lives on that seafloor. So the traditional thought was you know, phytoplankton blooms will generate carbon, which will sink to the seafloor and feed the benthos. And yes, it does for large parts of the year. But at certain times of the year, particularly around the winter, you know, when we see large storms taking bits of, um, ripping off bits of kelp and transporting them large distance out, out to sea, it's an important fuel, an important food source for the, for the biodiversity that lives on the seafloor. So my two requests are that we, if we undertake seaweed farming, we do it in a way that is in harmony with the other goods and services that seaweeds are so important to, to provide. So maintaining biodiversity, carbon sequestration, provision of food, all of these things uh, are, are considered. And the second thing is we protect those um, on charismatic um, ecosystems which are so critical to receive the carbon that's being produced and actually are currently under a huge amount of pressure and treated quite quite badly at the moment yeah thank you very much so i think um if you think of seaweed as something uh, slimy uh, smelly and unsexy we all understood it's time to get over it <laughs> Seaweed is part of our future, and, and we need to build a seaweed industry that uh, learned from the past, as you mentioned. And uh, we should not reproduce the, uh, the GM uh, problems and, and the industrial farming and the proprietary seeds and so forth. So we need to be very careful. Maintaining the biodiversity is indeed very important uh, across the seaweed. Someone, something we have not mentioned is also the integration of seaweed with, uh, with the salmon farms and other type of aquaculture. So it can really improve and create some ecosystem uh, at sea. If you want to build ecosystem at sea instead of destroying them, seaweed is a very good place to start. So I will, I will, I will give the floor now to uh, to uh, to our guest from the America because we need uh, we have uh, we had only uh, European feedback so far, I think. <laughs> and actually, seaweed are, are are hidden for a long time in uh, in uh, in the world. Actually, we, we started to eat seaweed as human being, and then we moved to uh, we moved to um, uh, we moved to other type of food, terrestrial food. And the oldest trace of, uh, of seaweed in the world as a food is in Chile, in the, north, in the south of Chile, in the, in the cave of Monte Verde, where you have traces of seaweed that are 22 different seaweeds uh, used for food and medicines, which are 15,000 years old. And uh, in Chile, uh, seaweed remains, and that's the only country out of Asia, maybe, and especially in the south, remain part of the local delicacies and, and, uh, and uh, are eaten like uh, quite often. So I will have this uh, Maria Teresa Garcia, the marine biologist from, from Chile, to comment on, on, on this. What's your experience from Chile about, uh, about seaweed, about how you integrate it to a salmon farm? And also maybe tell us a word about why you think uh, seaweed are often related to insect and, uh, and this type of new food, which it doesn't make really sense because that's totally different. But, uh, but maybe you have, a, you, have a, you have a thought about this. 
Well, thank you. Thank you for having me here. Um, I'm not the only one from America. It's from North America. I'm, no, <laughs> from UK. Oh, I'm well, sorry. Well, they left to your, they left Europe, oh, but they are still in America. In, okay. in, uh, in, uh, okay. <laughs> they are not yet in America. I switched. <laughs> I thought you, you, you were living in New York. Sorry. No, but we have indeed Alison, who is from, uh, okay. from New York, but I was talking about physics. Well, I, uh, I'm a agronomist engineer. I produce food and I am looking for different ingredients to feed uh, fish. Now, at the time, I'm uh, writing my thesis on alternatives for uh, tank. Tank is a fish. Uh, and it is not salmon, which, which is important because we have to have biodiversity, you said it. And aquaculture is uh, a way to produce food uh, more efficiently. And uh, I was uh, looking for different ingredients and to use less fish to produce fish. There is an index FIFO, fish in, fish out. And to produce one kilo of salmon, we need, uh, I, I don't remember exactly every time less, uh, but we're trying not to need fish to produce fish. And in that way, I was looking for uh, soy, but soy is also not so good. And all the chain, the, 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 the chain from agriculture to, to fish is difficult. So I, uh, discover this uh, insect meal and insect is uh, also it, it is not new uh, people has eat uh, insect in the world since lot lots of time not in cold weathers only in the tropics uh, because it is poikilothermus they don't need uh, temperature to grow uh, like aquaculture species, uh, that, that, that's, that's why they are efficient. And um, I, I was looking for new ingredients and I discovered this uh, smell, this insect uh, smell. But the, the problem with this smell is that the profile of uh, fatty acid is not enough and we need omega-3. And omega-3 is a nutrient that algae, algae is a good name yeah, for yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah, I mean, yeah. seaweed is not good, algae probably. <laughs> and uh, omega-3 is, is in algae and yeah. it's rich. So the combination with insect is probably that your answer. Probably when we talk about new ingredients to eat, we can talk about insect and we talk about seaweed. And the other thing I, the, is that we, if we don't try new things, we are not going to have new outcomes. So if we are stuck with producing beef and producing cattle and producing goat and pig, we are, we are having the same results and we know how it works. So it, if we are looking for new things, see which is uh, uh, definitely a good alternative. And other, otherwise you don't use land, uh, you don't uh, need much, uh, it is efficient. And the other uh, common characteristic they have with insect meal is that they are uh, rustic. They don't need much and they adapt. And this is a, also a characteristic that we need to, to face climate change, the rustic yeah. thing. I think that's your okay. answer. Thank you very much. And uh, <laughs> you'll share the recipe of Cuchayoyo next time. Oh, uh, I should talk. Uh, we <laughs> ate a lot of Cuchayoyo in Chile. Cuchayoyo is a Diovilea seaweed. Yeah, it's a seaweed. Is, uh, yeah, it's a seaweed and I ate a lot of Cuchayoyo. It's really healthy. Yeah, very. So, <laughs> this, is, this is another thing I, I remember now to talk about. Uh, the way that we should introduce uh, seaweed or algae in, is about with cookers. Uh, we have to make the change yeah. sexy, make the change fun, and we have to make delicious food and, and that are good for, for us and good for the planet. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, important. And, uh... Thank you very much. We need to work with uh, chefs and trendsetters indeed to promote this new type of food and to, uh, and to share this. What you said about uh, the fish, uh, the aquaculture is very important as well. 
uh, we need to create once again uh, integrated multi-trophic aquaculture and, uh, and much more than it is right now to make aquaculture a bit uh, greener than it is today uh, because uh, that, uh, that, that, that's so important, I think. So, uh, and with regard to omega-3, just a quick anecdote. Uh, I spoke with um, archaeologists who, uh, who were in Monteverde and they told me that, in fact, we became sapiens because we intake a lot of wind. We had a lot of omega-3 uh, long-chain fatty acids so, um, over many thousands of years to move from. A and that's the only way we moved from apes to sapiens. Our brain sort of mutated. The genetic mutation of our brain was triggered by this massive intake of uh, om omega-3 uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid. So the... the we are what we are because we were all together uh, fishing and, and collecting wild and weakling seaweed in, in the beach. That may be a you know, very old patriarchal perspective from the archaeology saying that where we become sapiens because male were, men were going to hunt mammoths very bravely and the women stayed in the cave with the children. But actually, this is not true. I mean, we became sapiens because we were all together collecting winking seaweeds uh, on the beach. And, uh, and that's the true story. And I think Monteverde illustrates very, very well uh, this. So, uh, so we understand now that we need, we need to cultivate and we need to preserve. And uh, we need to conserve, conserve that biodiversity and put that into action. And you know, conservation without financing is conversation. So uh, we need you now to move to uh, finance, targeted finance, I would say. And I would ask um, uh, Dan Crockett from Blue Marine Foundation, who very uh, impressively uh, put this uh, this big uh, this big um, panel in the, in the canteen of the COP, where it's promoting uh, all the ocean can do, and notably seaweed, and the very important role of seaweed for and kelp for carbon sequestration, notably. So what about targeted finance and uh, how, how can we enable all of this now? Thanks, Marcel. Um, I'm a surfer, uh, so in lots of different parts of the world, uh, kelp forest means that the waves are glassy and they're better for surfing. But of course, that means that there's a huge climate adaptation and resilience benefit. It also means you're much less likely to get bitten by sharks. So it's a good place to hang out inside the kelp beds. Kelp is actually how I got into this whole marine conservation world about 12 years ago. I was living in the Outer Orkney Islands, which are off northern Scotland. And they're not considered a kind of um, island paradise, um, but sometimes you have incredible visibility. And I was free diving out there. And while free diving in the kelp forest, um, you know, these huge, huge fronds of kelp, um, stipes of kelp, and uh, looking up in these kind of cathedrals of light coming down. It was full of big fish, much bigger fish than I'd ever seen in Cornwall, where I live. And it was really a realization that, that, that this is an incredible um, thing. And um, imagine if it grew on land. Imagine if a species like kelp grew on land at the same rate that it does in the sea. You know, we wouldn't have one event about seaweed. I mean, we'd have billions and, I mean, whatever, some of the figures being bandied around for forests. It would be one of the most extraordinary and investable things on this planet and people would be uh, going mad for it. Um, I don't think it's just seaweed that has a branding problem. I think the ocean in general has a branding problem and a stat I heard earlier this week really stuck with me, which is that SDG 14, Life Below Water, receives 0.5 of 1% of finance. So then, I mean, that shows where we're at. Um, so yeah, it's, I think it's, there's an extraordinary opportunity here. Um, I would love to see the sort of wall of money that's excited about kelp carbon um, on a no regret space. I mean, we, many of you will have seen the announcement yesterday from some of the biggest companies in the world, Netflix, Disney, Salesforce, um, a, a Blue Carbon Buyers Alliance, which is fantastic. I would love to see some of that money uh, not invested, but donated on a no regrets basis to understand this extraordinary habitat and what it does. Um, and really building on, on Steve's point, I, you know, the, the biodiversity that surrounds kelp and lives within kelp um, is, is incredible. And maintaining that as a focus, I think, is, is of paramount importance as this, um, the, this, whole, this whole landscape grows and grows and grows. Um, it's probably me. Thank you very much. Um, 
Thank you for this. And it's, it's indeed important. We had the uh, Bezos Earth Foundation who recently donated $100 million uh, for, uh, to, to the WWF to support the uh, seaweed social licensing, which is a good news, I think, and we need uh, a, a lot of them uh, to do the same. So that's, that's very important as well. There's one question that uh, I will turn to the science part of this uh, panel and Stephen and, and Carlos. There's a question that always come back when we talk about growing seaweed and sinking it down in the sediment. So, which is uh, uh, what potential, I mean, uh, can the ocean absorb so much carbon, first of all? Uh, and what could be the potential consequences on the carbon floor and the carbon bio, uh, on, the, on the sediment biodiversity? We know that there's a lot of organ living organisms there. Uh, and we, 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 we surely don't want, I mean, there's a big discussion about deliberately sinking seaweed. Uh, what, what could be the potential, which is an ethical question, because we will sink food while you have a lot of people starving. Uh, but it's also a, an ecosystemic question, because uh, you may damage this ecosystem, create bacteria bloom or gastropod blood or whatever. So Carlos and Stephen, maybe uh, Carlos first, and then Stephen, uh, before we close the session. Uh, uh, yeah, so we've heard already from our colleague in the panel about uh, probably one of the first experiments to look at the impacts of sink sinking uh, seaweed in the ocean. And, you know, that, that is being discussed, but in my opinion, should be a last uh, resort, almost a resort in, des in desperation, because seaweed is actually wonderful material. So just, uh, yeah, I think this is all driven also by the carbon mining. Everybody's now, the whole work is translating to carbon. And we don't think about the many benefits that we derive from wonderful living creatures like, like uh, seaweed. So I just consider that about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there was a shock in the global uh, food market because the price of biofuels uh, raised to the level that farmers in the US uh, derive more profit from selling their corn crops for biofuel rather than for human food, right? So that actually is the origin of the Arab Spring is the rise in price of a uh, cereal uh, and uh, corn in the global market and also major turmoils in uh, countries in uh, in South America and Central America because of the price of corn went up which is a major staple so we shouldn't really uh, be this is an ethical question as you mentioned uh, uh, there's a lot of people uh, experiencing hunger in the world uh, we should not uh, take uh, seaweed that could be used to feed people and sink it in the ocean when there's people experiencing a famine simply because of the value of carbon. So there's an, an ethical question that we need to consider, but also do consider that uh, we can derive wonderful products from uh, seaweed, not just uh, feeding uh, humans, but also close the food cycle of aquaculture farming. So right now, uh, and I would like to acknowledge uh, the person that is sitting by my side that uh, recently received uh, somebody doing a great work on uh, blue foods and uh, claiming for the importance that we keep a uh, small pelagic fish to address problems of nutrition in the developing world rather than trust them as flour and oil and feed it to salmon in aquaculture. So right now we use 20 million fish uh, caught from the wild to, to produce 5 million fish from aquaculture and create huge problems of famine and undernourishment in Bangladesh and many other na nations for which these small plastic fish were a major staple. Just imagine that we can solve this problem using seaweed and we can close the, the, the food cycle in aquaculture, render aquaculture truly sustainable and produce regenerative blue food. So that, that is not only ethical, but it's a, an obligation to maintain human well-being. And we are in the UN SDG from, uh, pavilion. So we should not look at climate action only, we should generate benefits across all of the SDGs, including poverty, alleviation, and uh, social justice as well. So it's a matter of social justice yeah. in there, but we can also produce biofuels. We can produce wonderful uh, supplements for the food industry. We can produce pharma products. And uh, when we think about seaweed, uh, besides the problem of the name, we also think there's a one thing, but I often like to say that if we look at the tree of life yeah. and we look at where, seaweed occurring the tree of life the the difference in terms of evolutionary history of seaweed is the same uh, between fungi and elephants so if we are wise at using the broad diversity of seaweed we can actually solve many many problems so almost too good to be true but it's actually 
true. So there's this element that we can derive so much value for the farmer and we can derive so much value for society by using seaweed than other than sink it, that that should be the last uh, resort uh, uh, at all. And then there's one last element and is that I've actually been working on the Sargasso Sea. So I've been working on a research vessel in the Sargasso Sea. Uh, I was doing plastic research, but when you put a, a trolling net on the Sargasso Sea, a Newstone net, it comes full of buckets of uh, Sargasso. It is not carbon. It is a whole habitat where uh, the Caribbean lobster, the megalopa, the larvae of the Caribbean lobster recruit on the Sargasso. Also the lamprey and endangered species recruits on the Sargasso and many, many animals have their early life stages free from that habitat. So when you package and sink it, you're actually sinking the future crops of lobster in the Caribbean and many other wonderful organisms. It's a habitat, it's not carbon, it's not trash. So we need to think about that uh, as well. And uh, I, I wanted to pick up on something that was raised earlier about the need to work with, uh, with uh, chefs. So uh, I am the scientific uh, director of a new conference series called uh, Meeting of the Seas, but you need to uh, Google it with the Spanish name, Encuentro de los Mares, uh, .es. So we started that uh, three years ago uh, to uh, co-create new sustainable blue foods uh, between Mission Star Cooks, uh, marine scientists like myself, and different people in the seafood industry. And it's really a wonderful forum to develop new, these new foods. And this year, uh, in June, we had a focus on, on algae. And then, then there's one invasive species in, uh, that is creating major problems in Southern Spain. That is a rugolopter, is a, an algae originally from Japan that is also washing to in large numbers to the Spanish beaches. So we challenge the cooks and scientists to come up with uses for that uh, seaweed. And then, uh, in fact, it was the people that were doing most of the research on Ferradria, uh, 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 restaurant. So he developed the molecular cuisine. So we challenge those to team up with scientists to come up with new foods. They discovered that this is the only other um, uh, spice that is uh, hot on the throat, in addition to all of the others come from uh, capsicum. So it's the only non-capsicum -capsic spice that produces this hot uh, flavor on the, on the throat. All of the other are nose, right? Yeah. So that's very useful because for those who, who which are uh, allergic to capsicum, now we have a solution for them if they enjoy spicy food. It's actually quite spicy, but we also uh, uh, develop new sauces, uh, spicy sauces from this algae, and they even did a distill. And the distill, which is like a, is as a, a marine gin, was so good that it's actually coming to market. So it's a really uh, the first distilled product from gin is going to come from market. So when we put a value to that thing that was being washed in the shore, it was not only carbon value, but a, a value across different elements in the food industry. It actually, it's a very important resource. Now we look differently at this thing that washes from the sea from being a course to actually being a, a, a gift. But that again, we do not, uh, that's something we also emphasized yesterday when we uh, were celebrating the announcement of blue carbon programs here in the UK is that scientists do not uh, create solutions. We need to co-create those solutions with many other people in the ecosystem. Absolutely. Stephen Award, maybe. Um, yeah, I completely agree with, with Carlos. And um, I think we need to get away from the concept that the deep ocean is pl the place where we put things we don't want. You know, it's an amazing and it's a beautiful ecosystem in its own right and deserves as much protection as everywhere else. So I, 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 I have to agree. I really agree with you strongly there. I also would like you to think about seaweeds as the most incredible organisms around. I have a colleague at Plymouth Marine Laboratory who studies the language of seaweeds. Seaweeds talk to the environment around them through chemicals. They don't use sound, they use chemicals and they communicate with marine, marine microbes and they create a, um, a, bio, a, a, a biotic um, community that lives on their outer um, skin or their outer layers that is similar to our gut flora. So they can create a, um, the microbial community they need to ensure they have effective nutrients to be absorbed and to, keep, uh, and to keep them healthy. And when that language and that communication breaks down, 
they become unhealthy and they can attract uh, bad bacteria. So in the same way that we drink these biotic yogurts to keep our guts healthy, the seaweeds actually use chemicals to communicate to microbial organisms and attract them to keep their, them healthy as well. And when we think about when we're starting to farm these, 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 these seaweeds, we need to start to understand those processes so that we can help them stay healthy. You know, and we can make sure that the, 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 the organisms that we, we farm are maintained in a healthy state in a natural way. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. They, they are always amazing properties with seaweed. What, what? Yeah. Yeah. I, I was going to add one thing on the language of the seaweed. And is that as a scuba diver, I was all, always intrigued when I've been uh, scuba diving in, uh, in kelp forest of a sound that I didn't really know quite what it was. And that sound was, uh, was actually uh, described in a paper with the sources uh, a year ago. And that's the sounds of photosynthesis. So uh, when you uh, scuba dive in a productive kelp uh, forest, there is a, if you listen carefully, and many people, uh, for some reason, they don't have the habit of listening underwater, which we should all develop that because it's very informative. But it's a sound like a scintillating uh, small bells. That's actually the sound of uh, oxygen bubbles racing from the kelps. And then as they emerge to the surface, then the lower pressures uh, expand them and at, at one point they burst. So when they burst, they make this scintillating sound, but then you have millions of those bubbles bursting at the same time. And it's a wonderful sound, the sound of photosynthesis that you can only hear in the ocean. Yeah, that's fantastic. There are so many great stories about uh, seaweed. We, we thank you very much, Carlos and Stephen, for this. Uh, we have not mentioned as well, but seaweed, uh, uh, once dry, retain very well uh, its nutrient, so which is a good news because it, I mean, you can dry it o o on shore on the uh, tropical countries and, uh, and keep, keep them for months with no need of any cold chain. And, uh, and once again, it's very, it's very healthy and keeps all the nutrients. For, for instance, in Japan, uh, they, during the COVID lockdown, when we were rushing in to supermarket to buy pasta in Europe, they were buying uh, dried seaweed, for instance. So guess uh, who gained more weight in the end? <laughs> so anyway, no, but seriously, I mean, having a product that does not, that, that is very nutritious and, and does not need to be kept cold is a very good news, both for um, emerging countries and for our climate, I think. So uh, I will leave this, uh, this closing remark uh, to, uh, to the World Food Prize uh, 2021, I think. <laughs> so uh, Shakuntala, just, uh, uh, who is also leading uh, the Blue Food Coalition, sort of, uh, uh, taking a very active part and who took a very active part in the UN Food System Summit that took place this year and which was so important and uh, which uh, acknowledged the, the need to uh, totally change our food systems. Uh, in the upcoming uh, years, and I think blue food has a great role to play. And once again, seaweed is a fundamental role. And maybe you can talk about your experience as well in uh, in Bangladesh. And well, Carlos, we have to, we will have time. No worries. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Fasa. Well, as Carlos mentioned, I've been quite engaged with the UN Food Systems Summit, which. Um, had the last meeting in November of this year. Uh, if I would look at some of the, so the, the UN Food Systems Summit was touted as a people's summit and a summit for solutions. And if I would go there, so then within the UN Food Systems Summit, there is a group of um, the, the scientific group, which is made up of scientists, and uh, they identified seven priorities for moving forward to the solutions. And of these seven priorities, the one of these was sustaining aquatic foods. So, so we, we've reached far with respect to transforming food systems, not just food systems, but food, land, and water systems with using aquatic foods as one of the solutions. Also within the UN Food System Summit, there were other solutions that were offered. And one, I think very much based on um, what we are seeing with all the disruptions with COVID-19 was um, from sustaining school feeding and expanding school feeding. 
And if I look at school feeding programs throughout the world, they have been, there's a range of success and failures. But if we just look at, for example, milk powders, I imagine milk powders in, in school feeding programs goes back, what, four generations, five generations, about. Um, it, would be, it would be great if we can look for some, if we can diverse that range of, pro, of, of, of products that use in school feeding. And one that I have proposed in the UN Food Systems Summit is that we should now be looking to make a diversity in products that are used in school feeding. And the one that I've put highest on the list, and I'm working, not just me, but that a few of us are working towards, is combining these solutions and therefore promoting uh, seaweed as a source of um, of um, nutritious foods, of superfoods within school feeding programs. And also within the mother and child healthcare programs and the food transfer programs that now many countries have to put in place in wake of the disruptions of COVID-19. Um, we've heard about the very many uh, nutritional benefits of seaweed, yes, and the ones that I focus on are the micronutrients, vitamins and minerals, as well as essential fatty acids, and as you mentioned, Vasa, which is so very important for where we have reached today as humans because of the micronutrients, because of the essential fatty acids, which are, which are very high in, in various seaweed. Um, you mentioned another point which is extremely important when you want to focus on the poor and vulnerable and uh, a food product that can be used in the first 1000 days of life, which is from the time of conception until the child's second birthday. So where we focus on how do you promote cognition development and growth, which has intergenerational benefits. It's starting with the pregnant woman and the breastfeeding woman because the recommended age of complementary feeding of children is from six months of age. So it would be really fantastic if in the products that we are using for pregnant and lactating women, that they include these superfoods, which are series, and also from six months of age, that you include it in complementary, um, complementary foods for, for young children. And what's really important is that you can use it as a dried product, thereby up-concentrating the micronutrients and the essential fatty acids with a factor about four, between four and five. And this is extremely important for small children because of the low gastro, the, the capacity of the gastrointestinal tract. You need products that are extremely dense in micronutrients and essential fatty acids. And if you would want to reach the poor and vulnerable, which we have to, especially now with the COVID-19 disruptions, you need a product that is safe and you need a product that has a long shelf life and does not require refrigeration. Absolutely, absolutely. And I think as you stated, uh, Carlos, uh, social justice is also a direct outcome of, uh, of, of more seaweed and that's what we are all targeting for. So where we are today, I think we, we need the investments for greater research, within the diversity of uh, this group of microorganisms and uh, the investments for the research into the nutrient composition, the food safety of these uh, and the development of products that can be used, for example, in school feeding programs. Absolutely, and school feeding program is important. In Korea, they already promoted very successfully uh, seaweed, which is which was already a uh, uh, usage in a, in a, in, a, in the daily life, but they really strongly promoted through a school feeding program, and it worked very well. And now uh, kids are, are loving seaweed. Carlos, you wanted to say uh, something? Uh, yes, of course. Uh, in this uh, UN SDG pavilion, then the most important announcements of COP are taking place, right? So we already we already announced that the seaweed farming uh, is a uh, one hectare sequesters a uh, on average, uh, the equivalent of carbon sequestration of three hectares of Amazonian forest. But I want to get back to the forgotten forest of the sea that also Damien has, uh, Daniel has been uh, 
discussion, which is an Amazonian forest that is a ribbon around the continents and has been really left behind and forgotten. And I'd like to announce that it's a coalition of organizations that is going to uh, launch uh, starting next year, a three year expedition to further our understanding of the forests of the sea. The program is called Forests of the Sea and it has a strong scientific and a strong uh, communications uh, component. The communication component is driven by the director of the uh, Oscar uh, the Oscar receiving uh, documentary this year, My Octopus Teacher, which uh, celebrates a uh, uh, marine forest. And then uh, I'm hoping uh, that there will be an announcement soon so that everybody can engage and participate, but it, it will be a three year expedition through uh, the marine forest regions of the world to better understand their ecology, their biology, and their benefits that society derived from them. So we no longer forget this uh, Amazonian forest that rests in the sea. Uh, absolutely, and very good point. So ju just would like to remind that indeed uh, the seaweed sector has a great momentum, but remains very, very fragmented for the moment. So we build uh, for memories the first ever global coalition for seaweed stakeholders, fully free uh, for joining. So uh, the Safe Seaweed Coalition, which was uh, formed by uh, Lloyd's Register Foundation and United Nations Global Compact. So safeseaweedcoalition.org if you want to take a look. It's the, the idea is really to embrace as much as we can all the seaweed stakeholders in this coalition and, and create collaboration because we need to uh, accelerate change and attract investors if we want to really scale up this industry in, in the right way. It's a bit amazing because this coalition has raised much more uh, expectation and interest that we uh, anticipated and we are now forming a group of um, seaweed ambassadors which will be formally uh, uh, linked with the, the coalition. It, it's a volunteer uh, volunteer. Uh, title, I would say, but we will train people so they can, in their respective countries, promote and, and by, by their respective communities, promote the use of seaweed, tell about the benefit and try to spread the word. So he, he, that's why the journalists started to call that the seaweed revolution, because we are we are forming and we are training through this coalition a list of people. So if you are interested, uh, just uh, drop us a line at the, at the safeseaweedcoalition.org secretariat. Uh, to join, we are uh, starting to uh, to create a big movement. I think the world is craving for good news, and uh, and seaweed is a very good news. It might well be the most untapped resource we have on the planet, uh, the greatest untapped resource we have on the planet. And uh, I think, as as it was mentioned by Peter, it's a uh, in much it's, this call is much more of an intergenerational commitment to hope, optimism, and and more social justice. So we we can make it, but we will need to be all together make it so i would like to thank a lot all these speakers today we have delivered great great uh, talks and uh, and see you soon we need to make uh, the change happen thank you very much